Welcome back to Winners and Losers, the show that looks at the highs and the lows from around world football this weekend. It was another international break weekend, unfortunately, but we're going to do our best to plough through it. It's me and Patrick Van Straten today, and the first winner was suggested by Arjun Rai underscore UK. It's England. Unsurprising, Pato. Yeah, they came from a goal down to beat Croatia 2-1. That puts them in the semi-finals of the UEFA oh. Nations League, and it relegates their opponents, which is the perfect revenge, of course, for that World Cup semi-final defeat. Now, I think overall this was a deserved victory. Southgate's man yeah. had 62% of the ball, had 17 shots, eight of those on That's target. Crazy. Well, by comparison, uh, the Croatians managed three shots on target. So Stones yeah. and Gomez looking like a really strong partnership at the moment. Um, Croatia a little bit depleted. They had no Mario Mandzukic. They had no even Rakitic. But they still took the lead on the 57th minute. Andre Kramaric, what a great goal from him. Twisting and turning away, finding a bit of space in the Where box. Where did we last hear that name, Pato? Uh, you talked about him last week, didn't you? Yes, on the podcast. I suggested Southampton should sign him. In fact, why not go and download the podcast if you haven't already? <laughs> Link's in the description below. And that's a great plug. It's a great plug. And it's not a bad shout, actually. It was surprisingly clever from you. Joe's actually very good on the podcast. You might not believe it, but he really really is. Anyway, uh, one of the other things that's hard to believe is that England are good now and they showed resilience. Yes. In the 77th minute, managed to make it level. Lingard got on the end of a Harry Kane shot that was kind of dribbling yeah. into the goal. Should he have just shepherded it in? No, because Jesse Lingard scores exclusive bangers and it was nice to see him score a tap in for once. All right, but I mean, it felt a little bit stolen, but I, I'll good. take it. Anyway, the Nugent vibes. <laughs> a few minutes later, Lingard did... Uh, do something that was absolutely kind of down to his own intelligence. He was mm. positioned on the line, managed to make a clearance, stopping uh, Croatia from taking the lead again. Jesse. And to me, that kind of really encapsulates what's good about Lingard. I feel like Lingard will do what the team requires whenever they require it. Yes, like, You agree. can see why Mourinho likes him, because he is a bit of a henchman. He will just do what you 100%. need when you need it. Workhorse. And I think, that, I think that's kind of underrated um, at the moment. Anyway, in the end, Harry Kane got the winner. 85th minute, managed to get on the end of a Ben Chilwell. Dangerous free kick is the ball. Yes. Whipped in. We love a fullback on a free kick in it's, it's, a, it's a very odd one. You'd expect to see an in-swinger, but instead he just curls it kind of along the defensive line mm. and Kane manages to slide in and put it in the corner. Anyway, that ends a seven-game drought for Kane, not scoring for England. That's his 20th goal for the country. So... All in all, a good day to be an England fan. Yeah, a good I little assume. international break, actually. We had Wayne Rooney's testimonial. He nearly oh, scored, yeah. didn't he? Oh, Brad Guzan, you should have <laughs> let it in. And then, obviously, we beat Croatia in the one that actually <laughs> matters. It's actually a good result, though, because to top that group was no mean feat. Spain and Croatia, sure. two extremely experienced sides, two probably of the best sides in the entire competition. England now have won four of their last five matches. In fact, we've not beaten Croatia since 2009. We've got a bit of a torrid record against them. Um, but Zlatko Dalic came out after the game, he said, wow, that England team's really exciting, really young, fast. He even said it's coming home very soon. Nice to hear the nice. words, Zlatko. Uh, set pieces though. Still England's main threat. They were our main threat at the World Cup, weren't they? 10 of our 17 efforts on goal came from dead balls. Jesus. It's obviously something we've worked Allardyce on heavily. Football. Obviously, it's well talked about how Southgate went off and studied basketball really heavily to try and make the most of set pieces in his uh, time away from management. And now he's back managing and it's paying off, isn't it? Uh, a couple of the game's key performers. I do want to mention Brozovic for Croatia. He played alongside Modric. Six tackles and interceptions, three aerial duels, one, two dribbles, one shot, 94% pass accuracy. We love Brozovic. That's amazing. At Football Daily. We love him. Surely not long before he gets a big move. Mm. Um, John Stones, though, for England, continues his dominance of the centre-back area for having a fantastic season at Man City alongside Laporte and doing it for the three Lions as well. Two interceptions, six aerial duels, one, 94% pass accuracy, two key passes, four shots, Pato. John Stones, two key passes, I four know. shots. It's crazy, but he's... Are these all flick-ons from corners? They must all be flick-ons because we are so dangerous from set pieces, but he's just having such a good season. I, ge I genuinely can't believe some of the stats that are on this sheet of paper. It's Please crazy. carry on. I mean, Raheem Sterling, get ready for this one. 
five tackles and interceptions. Why? What has happened there? Southgate is breathing fire into him. I don't know. It, Everyone's it, a defensive midfielder. Under it's, inc it's incredible. Man of the match, though, probably was Harry Kane. Two tackles and interceptions, just Not the bad. two for our centre forward on the day. But five aerial duels won. He's incredible at holding the ball up, Harry Kane. There are very few forwards in the world better Even against the, the best centre-back in the world. Dejan Lovren. Yeah, what although did you see Sergio Ramos? He was like livid, Lovren. Photo. Oh, God. Oh, it's just, it, I mean, it's glorious <laughs> shithousery from Sergio Ramos, but <laughs> Dejan Lovren, not a happy bunny. He also had five shots, four on target, back to those sort of numbers we expect from Harry Kane uh, in his prime. Uh, just been a really good year, really, for Gareth Southgate and this England side. Yeah, definitely. World Cup semi-final, top in the UEFA Nations League. Congratulations to Southgate and to Harry Kane. It's another good result. First losers of the week are Belgium. This comes from at Torgan, your side. Hey. I think it's going to be Thorgan, your side, like thorn in your side. It doesn't you know, work. A bit of wordplay. It? it doesn't work. It doesn't. It's been a bad weekend for uh, people who made the semi-finals of the World Cup. It really Except has. Except for England. They're the only team who won. Yeah, true. Because obviously Belgium lost 5-2 to Switzerland, meaning they are out of the UEFA Nations League finals, despite actually going 2-0 up inside 20 minutes. Bobby Martinez magic. Classic Bobby Martinez defensive showing this, <laughs> wasn't it? Utter turd. Uh, Switzerland obviously needed to beat Belgium going into the game by two clear goals. So pretty much everything was stacked against them. They went 2-0 down. They needed to beat them by two clear goals to progress. It looked completely unlikely when Thorgan Hazard uh, bagged a brace, didn't he? The 25-year-old now has as many goals as starts in the UEFA Nations League. You actually mentioned him on the podcast, I believe. Yeah, I did. This is a great week for it's us. A great we look like number geniuses. Of plugs for the podcast because he had a great game. Um, however, Nasir Chadley, let's touch on him because he was playing as an auxiliary Fullback under Bobby Martinez. Classic Bobby Quality. Martinez manoeuvres here. Uh, <laughs> gave away a penalty, didn't he, on 26 minutes. Oh, Ricardo gosh. Rodriguez stepped up, got his sixth in 61 games for the national side. And then Seferovic went on a madness, bagging a hattie, didn't he? Uh, they combined him and Shakiri brilliantly in this game. I think they combined for the equaliser as well and for the one after that. Seferovic is just on fire. Five goals in four appearances. He's got an assist as well. I think he's averaging a UEFA Nations League goal contribution. How about that for a phrase? Every 50 minutes. He, he's producing bits and pieces. Shakiri as well. Have I made this up or was Seferovic in Hamill shouts as well for Real Betis? I think he was. I think he was. He was. He actually was. What is going We've on? We've had Seferovic. We've had Kramaric. We've even had Forgan Hazard. We mentioned all these players on the podcast, so you have to go and download it now. This is It'd mental. It'd be rude not to. Go It'd on. be rude not to. Seferovic crushing it, as is Shakiri, who has been, quite frankly, unplayable of late for the national team. He's averaging three and a half key passes in the Nations League, as well as 3.8 shots and 3.3 dribbles per 90. Oh my God. Vile. Yeah, and he really took on responsibility in this game. When Xhaka came off, he took the armband. Uh, he made four chances in this game, completed all six of the six dribbles he attempted, Madness. two interceptions and two assists. In fact, he now has six assists and two goals in his last 10 games for club and country. Uh, now, it really shows how Switzerland were able to get into the deepest areas of the pitch without Belgium really doing much about it. Shakiri had twice as many touches in the box as Dries Mertens on the other That's side. That's crazy, isn't it? And four of Belgium's chances came from under six yards out. One in four of their chances was under six yards out. That's crazy. Um, really good emerging talent as well on display. Uh, young boys, 23-year-old Kevin and Babu putting in a star turn in his very first international game. You might remember him from Newcastle, um, though he never really quite caught fire there. They I think he, wonder kid, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think he played three times for them, got injured a lot, mm. went on loan to Rangers, ended up back in his homeland in Switzerland with young boys, won the title. Um, and that was the first time he'd actually played 30 plus games in a year. It's good to see him come full circle. Good to see him come full circle because he's a bit of a football manager star that never was. Yeah, well, hopefully he will be. Like, he looks like he's kicking on. Four tackles and interceptions in this game, two chances created, two aerial duels, and of course, an assist. A uh, cut cross turned home on the 84th minute. I think that was, was that Seferovic again? I think, I think that was been... Seferovic. I think that was one of the Hattie goals. And Bobby Martinez, only his third loss in 33 games, but this was a really punishing one. And to be honest, even when Belgium were good at the World Cup, it wasn't like this looked impossible. Like we think about them mm. against Japan when they went 2-0 yeah. down. And yes, they were able to come back, but at the time you thought, 
this is exactly what I expected Bobby Martinez as Belgium to be. So, um, yeah, obviously they won't go to the finals now, but the Swiss will. Played out in Portugal in June. Huge games, a real opportunity to nail their place for the 2020 Euros. Our final winner was suggested by Fab Foyf and he made Pato a very happy bunny. It's the Dutch Patrick. Yeah, there's a reason I'm wearing orange today. The oh, Netherlands oh. beat France 2-0 at home, ending the world champions 15 game unbeaten run and relegating Germany from their group. That is a horrific group, by the way. You haven't even made the World Cup and you get drawn in a group with France and Germany. And they yeah. could top the group if they beat Germany. But how good for the Dutch. The Dutch hate the Germans and yeah. they relegated them by beating the it's, world champions. It's perfect. It could not be more entertaining. And to be honest, they battered France 59% of the possession, 18 shots with 11 on target. France had two shots on target. 11 on target's crazy. Two, I don't, I'd be amazed if France, if France conceded 11 shots on target in the knockout stages of the World Cup. They were so defensively solid. Yeah. But in this game, they really had no answer to Dutch yeah, pressure. Yeah. Went behind in the 44th minute. Ryan Babel had a close range effort, Remember saved by Lloris. And it was a good save, but Jeannie Wijnaldum, as he always is, somehow yeah. on hand just to tap in. He's got two goals in his last three games and he's got 10 in 51 overall for the Netherlands. Remarkable. He loves to score in big games. He, yeah. he does the same for Liverpool. I think Klopp utilises him really well in the big matches and he always seems to be in the right position for a tap-in or a header or like a scramble. Well, it, it, the thing is about Wijnaldum is he's not a great passer. He's not, he's not a great creator or anything, but what he is is just like, he's like if Musa Sissoko had a football brain. Yeah. You know, like and Musa Sissoko is always running, but with no real intention. Genie Wijnaldum is always running, but at least he's running to the right areas mm. and being a useful player. 100%. Either an option for a pass or a defensive presence or a goal scoring presence yeah. in the final third. Um, and anyway, in this match, that was obviously pretty much the difference. The, the Netherlands managed to continue to pile on the pressure and then in the 96th minute made the point safe when Memphis Depay uh, scored a little Penenka penalty after Musa Sissoko brought down Frankie de Jong in the box. Good work from him. <laughs> uh, so since Ronald Koeman took over in early February, he had a bit of a rough start. Um, but now they look like a very solid proposition, the Netherlands. Um, while he's played nine, won four, drawn three, lost two, they do have wins against France, Germany and Portugal and a draw against Belgium. It's decent, man. So they've been really good in the, big, in the big games. And actually, Koeman, for all his other problems, Koeman used to be very, very good at just building a solid defence. Mm. And it helps when you've got a pairing like Van Dijk and De Ligt at the back. Anyway, if they draw away to Germany tonight, Tough they'll game. win the group and that will guarantee them a playoff place even if they don't secure regular qualification next year. Yeah. So we might actually see the Netherlands at a first international tournament since what? Euro, since Euro, no, no, Ooh. since the World Cup. Since, since the World, World Cup. Cup. Yeah, I mean, it's unbelievable, isn't it? But talking of the World Cup, the World Cup winners had a torrid night under Didier Deschamps. He actually named a pretty strong 11. Uh, the front three was Mbappe, Griezmann and Giroud, which is almost their ideal front line under Deschamps. Deschamps yeah. loves Olivier Giroud, so this is not a rest. And I believe eight of the 11 who started actually played in the World Cup final as well. Ooh. So this was a really strong team for France, but they just struggled to create anything in the way of clear cut chances. Lurie though, at the other end, had to make nine saves. Nine, nine saves. saves, which Jesus. is just unbelievable. I think the midfield was a problem area for France going into this one though. Steven and Zonzi not having the best season at Roma. No. And it does make you wonder whether, he wasn't great at Stoke either. And it w does make me wonder whether Sevilla was like the only place he's going to work. Yeah. That's, it, it's, it's not unusual, that's happened before. It has happened to a lot of people before. Jesus and, Navas. Yeah, he obviously uh, was at fault for the first goal. He didn't make a single tackle or interception at the base of midfield. And I think Deschamps hooked him on 55 minutes. Not a good day. Uh, Giroud and Mbappe also, and he had one shot between them which I think was off target as well. And this is Giroud Ooh. struggling for game time at Chelsea, but Mbappe flying for PSG. On the other side though, the Dutch were good in nearly all areas. Their centre-back pairing I absolutely love. Virgil van Dijk and Matthias De Ligt, what, that's a glorious partnership. De Ligt was pocketing Kylian Mbappe in this game. And then you move into midfield, Frankie de Jong. We're all big fans of Frankie de Jong at Football Day. We think he's probably gonna get a huge move either this summer 
all the next. 88 passes, 93% accuracy, four tackles and interceptions, one key pass in this game, an all-round brilliant display, but not as brilliant as Memphis Depay, who is now, we're running out of superlatives to describe him. He is definitely going to get a move this summer. He has he to. He is crushing he it to. again for Leon, and he's crushing it for the national team. Two dribbles, seven key passes. Seven. <laughs> seven key <laughs> passes uh. in this game, and five shots on target. Now, we talk about that being like four shots on target oh and four God. shots in, in and around the box from players like Harry Kane as being truly elite. So five shots on target from Memphis Depay combined with that creativity is just obscene. I think he's having one of the best seasons of any forward in Europe so far. Eight goals and six assists in 20 appearances for club and country. But it's his all-round play that is so good. He's so dominant on the ball for yeah. Leon, and he's so dominant for Holland that United have to exercise that £35 million buyback clause at the end of the summer, even if it's just to sell him on. Yeah. He's just having a stunning season. But what's your guys' thoughts on the Dutch national team? Let us know in the comments below. We finish up our losers with an all-Irish affair. The Republic of Ireland drew with Northern Ireland 0-0 at home in a friendly and... God, it was not friendly for the fans. What a horrible Terrible day out teams. for everyone involved. I'm going to go straight into this because it's embarrassing. we just got to deal with it quickly. Northern Ireland have won two of their last 12 games. Public of Ireland have won one of their last 10. These two teams are so bad. They're so dreadful. Though, fa frankly, the fact that Northern Ireland is competing with the Republic of Ireland historically would be amazing. You know, 10, 15 years ago, Republic yeah. of Ireland pretty solid and Northern Ireland were nothing. Yeah. Northern Ireland at least have some sort of managerial mm. capability behind them. Whereas Martin O'Neill, at the head of the Republic of Ireland, is a disgrace. They were yes. booed for the third consecutive game at home and yet he is still in a job. They haven't scored any goals in their last three outings. In fact, in their last 20 games, they've only managed two goals or more on three occasions. That is so Horrific. damning. Horrific. And Adam Book, who gave us this recommendation to put them in our losers, he said this is the worst Ireland team in living memory. And just to put that in context, yeah. we're talking about the Republic of Ireland, who are terrible. Always have gone, been terrible. Have <laughs> barely gone to international tournaments. And yet everyone's saying this is the worst Republic of Ireland team ever. Yeah. Imagine, imagine. Honestly, if you search Ireland into Twitter, the abuse <laughs> towards Martin <laughs> O'Neill is absolutely obscene. And it's easy to see why, quite frankly. Northern Ireland uh, peppered him in this game. They were unlucky, Northern Ireland, to draw nil-nil. In fact, the Republic of Ireland must have just two shots on target and had an average pass accuracy of just 72%. At home. At home. They passed the ball out of play all of the time. I think their possession was 42%. And in fact, if it wasn't for Darren Randolph between the sticks, it could have got ugly. Uh, I think there was one mistake from Dara Lenihan uh, it's unfathomably bad defending to start with. And then Darren Land Randolph just produces an absolute madness. Martin O'Neill, how he hasn't been sacked, beggars belief. He is actually, get this, the fourth highest paid manager in international football. He's earning £2 million a year. That's more than Gareth Southgate. And his assist. Four, sorry, the fourth highest paid manager in international football. Genuinely. Who's ahead of him? Ahead of him are Santos, Deschamps, and Joachim Lowe. So Santos. Yeah, I mean... It's just incredible. They've, uh, they've all won major trophies, haven't they? They have all won major trophies. And, and then it's Martin O'Neill. And then it's Martin O'Neill. Above, above the likes of Roberto Mancini. Yep, Gareth Southgate. Whoever's managing China. Just, so I think it, it might be Lippi. It's honestly, it's unbelievable. And get this, the eighth highest paid is actually his assistant. It's Roy, Roy, uh, Roy Keane. <laughs> The two are rocking a combined total of £2.6 million. Oh my god. I don't god. know how it's happening. It's such ugly scenes. Ireland, the Republic, anyway, played Denmark tonight in the Nations League. Complete waste of time. May as well not turn up because they've already been relegated. <laughs> I've only just got one point. And the, the fact that, that he is earning treble the amount of Joe Schmidt, <laughs> who is in charge of the Irish Rugby Union side, who are winning everything, it, it is. It's just incredible. They beat the, they beat the All Blacks on the weekend, <laughs> and Martin O'Neill's just taken over three times as much as him. The, the Irish Twitter is kicking off. It's class. 
But Ireland, you're firmly in our losers. One of the worst teams I've ever seen play international <laughs> football. They got thumped 4 0 by Wales about a month ago. I saw Tahiti once, they were bad. I, 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 Tahiti would give Ireland a game. <laughs> Genuinely. <laughs> So that's it for winners and losers. But before you do anything else, download the podcast. It's a two-hour Sunday Vibe special. Link is in the description below. Pato, what else should people watch there? Uh, you should head over to EFD. Today, there's no Euro Roundup there, but instead, we've got one-on-one, -on -one, which is a brand new strand where we take a deeper dive, have a bigger look at a more in-depth topic. This time, it's going to be expected goals because a lot of you oh. were asking for an explainer video. And of course, Stat Wars The League is still going on, so make sure you check out the most recent episodes of that. Bye. Bye.